Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Coding 101 is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y. Today on Coding 101, it's a brand new module, folks. We're jumping into C. Welcome to a very abrupt Coding 101. I'm Father Robert Balasair, the digital Jesuit. And uh, I'm joined by a man who is the Code Warrior, but as of this segment is our super special guest co-host, <laughs> Mr. Lou Maresca. Lou, we got we to gotta find a new title for you because this is, this is going to get ridiculous. Hey, thanks for having me back, though, still. Yeah. Now, uh, we wanted to do something a little bit different because we know that a lot of our, our audience really enjoyed the Arduino segment. So we did a module with Mark Smith, that's Smitty Halibut, our, uh, uh, from, uh, from DEF CON, who showed us how to make a steampunk Arduino clock. Well, that's just C programming. And uh, I talked to Lou and he said, you know what, let's do a mini module. Let's go ahead and give some people the basics of C so that they could do programming for Arduino or an at Megachip or any other device that may use standard C. Uh, Lou, is that about right? Can, can we give that to the folk? Yeah, I mean, we, what we should do is we just start out from the very basic beginning and try to give them just the fundamentals of what C is all about. Um, it's a very legacy. It's it's you know it's, it's one of those things. that's legendary in the in the programming industry. We want to make sure that they get the basics as well. Right now, before we jump into the module, there are those who will look at a C module and say, "Well, why? why? I don't understand why. Why would you do that? There's so many other languages that that have surpassed C, that have replaced C as the standard. Why would we want to give people C? If, to them, what would you tell?" You know, C is, is, is alive and well in the industry. I mean, like you saw with all these Arduinos and all these different embedded devices, they're still allowing C programming. And the reason is, is it's, it's just raw speed. Um, you know, it's just, you know, without the overhead of object-oriented programming, it's, it's, it's just raw speed. I mean, that programmers who develop in C can develop very, very fast and efficient code. And I think, you know, and it's one of those things that's probably not going to go away for very, anytime soon. And its standards keep getting upgraded. Like, for instance, there's the old, old standards, but now there's actually some new standards that are adding some, some, some uh, what we like, like to call syntactic sugar in the actual logic and in the code and allows you to kind of do things today that you couldn't do in the original C code. So it's still live and well, and it's still being used by lots and lots of people in the industry. Yes, there was actually a host here in the in the studio who passed by the desk, and he passed me this book, and he said, C is still the best wow. language to learn. It strips away all that sugar, as you said, strips away the framework, strips away all the layers of abstraction, and really gets you down to knowing your constructs, which is what we're going to do. But before we do that, Lou, well, why don't we uh, find out what's going on in the world of programming? Let's do it. Uh, this little story comes to us from Science Daily. Now, we've known for a while that in the world of computer science, especially if you're teaching or learning it, you're going to get a lot of assignments that look at solutions. So we just want to know if you were able to solve for the problem that they gave you. Now, that's relatively easy. I mean, if the program works, great. If it gives you the right output, that's great. If it takes the right input, that's great. But there's an element that's been missing. And that is you can't tell from whether or not someone has the right solution if they have it. Now, Lou, we, we've talked about this. We talked about this with Steve Gibson. We talked about this with Smitty. Th this idea that there are people who can put code together, but then there are people who are true programmers, who can think of unique ways to reach a solution, ways that maybe haven't been taught to them, but that, that they conjure. That's, that's an it factor. I mean, you, do you, you look for that when you're working with, uh, with your employees, right? Definitely. We look for patterns, especially in when how people code, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, guess what? The researchers over at MIT say that they may have figured out a way to automate that search for it. Now, at this month's ACM, that's the Association for Computing Machinery, if you're a CS major, you're probably a member of, of that organization, uh, their conference on human factors in computing systems, well, they were able to create a, uh, a computing system that they call overcode that takes solutions presented by students and turns them into templates and then puts them side by side so you can see 
where they differ. Now, the interesting thing about this is they look first at variable names, then they look at the value of variable names. So even if you don't use the, the same variable names, they'll look at the procedure that they used to, to compute a solution, and then they look at the presence of subfunctions. Oh, in order to test this, what they did was they got 24 expert programmers and they had them look at a few thousand homework assignments, beginning CS homework assignments, and they identified specific patterns, people who, who tackled the problems in different ways. And what they found was that Overcode was not only able to have all the same patterns as those 24 experts, but it was able to do it in the fraction of the time. Now, the, the, the uh, creators of Overcode have said that the differences get even more pronounced as you get into more difficult solutions, more difficult problems, more difficult assignments. Uh, Lou, let me ask you this. If you had a system at your disposal that you could run against the code base, the code portfolio of anyone who might be applying for a job at Microsoft, and it could tell you whether or not they were cookie-cutter programmers or if they were programmers who showed true imagination and initiative, would that change the way that you hire? You know, I think it all depends on the type of question you're asking. If you're asking for a very kind of ad hoc question to somebody and you wanted to, and you, you know, they provided some kind of solution, you wanted to go figure that out, I think that would be very useful. But most, most interviews today, at least ones that I conduct, are giving some common problems, some, some common, common problems that people see in the industry. And so they'll come in and they'll answer those questions. And you can basically tell up front if they're following what the textbook said or if they come up with some very unique, maybe even more performance solution. So it's, it's sometimes if you're, if you're doing programming for a long time, if you're doing it for a long time, then you can basically tell. But I think, like you said, if you do an ad hoc solution, I think this would be really helpful to tell as, as you know, did they copy this from somewhere else? Did they maybe do a bunch of practicing before they came in? Or if they just, did they just come up with it? You know, that, 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 that would be very useful during an interview. Uh, let's go ahead and jump into the module, but first, I, I want to go ahead and uh, bring up this again. Uh, this isn't just something that Leo handed to me off the cuff. This is the book that he thinks is the Sea Bible. He says that this is his second copy of, uh, this is Kernigan, Kernigan and Ritchie. Oh, wow, yeah, Kernigan and Ritchie. Yeah. Well, I actually have this, but in a different color. Uh, yep. This is sort of the Sea Bible. If you are interested in all at all in programming in C, pick up a copy of this. You can still find this on Amazon and use it as your reference. But... Let's jump in. Lou, where do we start? <laughs> well, I think you, you held up what you need to start with. I mean, that that's, like you said, Dennis Ritchie, Ken Thompson, they came up with C during the Unix operating system when they were developing that. And then, uh, you know, Brian, however you pronounce his last name, I never always bastardize it, but Kernigan or Dennis Ritchie wrote down that description of the language and they produced that book. And that's still today one of the best um, uh, descriptions of the language that you can find. It, there's been people writing books year over year, uh, and and they just never ever get you know even close to the description of C that they have done in that book. So that that's kind of the the, the ultimate bible to all of C. Now there are some better um, newer implementations of that uh, uh, versions of that book, and some of them are out there. We'll put them in the show notes. But there are some new standards like there's the new ISO C99 and the C11 standards that have come out in the la about the last ten years uh, for C that have improved the language quite a bit. And that's not going to be in that book that you see that, that you showed there. So even some of the newer editions don't have that that stuff in there. So that would be kind of the place to start. But then the other thing that you have to do is you have to decide on what platform you're going to code on. Because C is, you know, universal. It can be going across. You can develop something in C on Linux and be able to then compile it and use the same code on Windows. But there are many different what we call compilers. And we've talked about this in the past where you can have, like, for instance, you have Microsoft's compiler. You also have the GCC compiler or the Clang compilers. You know, or or the compilers that you know um, that you can use on Mac or OS X or the ones that Windows, that kind of thing. And so we wanted to just kind of go in really fast and talk about a version of the compiler that you can use that can actually be used across all the different platforms. It's pretty easy to set up. Now let's go over some of the basics of C. Of course, it's a compiled language, so this, there's right. no interpretation here. It's not one of these hybrids. It's it's pure, straight, and simple compiled. You give it code, it's going to give you a binary and an ex executable. Right. It's also a strong typed language, right? We don't have dynamic variables like we would in, say, C Sharp. You have to declare what type of data you're going to be putting into your variables. Correct. I mean, that it's basically the, very similar to some of these these upper level or higher level languages, today, like C Sharp and and Java. But it it's again when you declare a type, you know exactly what size it's going to be and how much memory it needs to take. 
at the very raw level, at the memory, the machine code level. So, for instance, an integer is going to take eight bytes, that kind of thing. So, you're, you, when you declare something as an integer and it compiles down to machine code, you know that for sure when you put a number in there, it's going to be eight bytes, right? So, that's kind of the key with C. And is it's just, you know, what you have, what statically what you have on the page is exactly what the machine code is going to be. Right. Which is actually another reason to get one of these books is because they will go all over all the different variable types and you will see exactly how much memory each one's going to take. Uh, you, remember, C was developed at a time when we didn't have the computers that we have right now. You, you actually were very resource limited. And even though now you could just throw a bunch of resources at any sloppy code that you want, we know that it's it's better practice not to do that, to, to program efficiently. Right. Now, let's go to that first part, which is choosing a compiler, because C does require a compiler. You can actually get a couple for free, but Lou, can you recommend any? Sure. I want to correct myself, too. I say integers is not, it's actually four bytes. Double is an eight byte, so I want to make sure I correct myself. Right, right. Um, but, uh, so, yeah, so there's there's a there's a great one that I like to use. It's, it's a free one that you can use with many different IDEs today. Um, it's called Sigwin. Um, and Sigwin spelled C Y G W I N dot com. If you go there, it's Sigwin. It's a really cool package man uh, uh, profile that lets you actually install and select the different packages that you have that you need. Yeah. So I wanted to quickly show what that looked like when you when you installed it. It'll take about thirty seconds for me to show it here. So if I go um, actually pull up um, my development kit here, if I start the setup here, um, what you'll be able to see is this guy here. And so the Sigwin set up, and what you'll do is you're going to say, I'm going to install from the internet. You're going to pick a location that you want um, and just keep hitting next until it downloads it. And then the next thing you're, what you're going to do is you're going to choose a package. So there's going to be a whole laundry list of packages that you can actually choose from here. So this is what you're going to get. And it's very, very confusing. I'm not sure where they haven't changed this interface for a while. But the thing that you really need most is you need what they call the GCC or GCG++ compiler. So what you could do up here is you can just do a quick search of GCC, and then they have, they break it down to these different little levels here, but we're going to just choose D, D, E, V, E, L, which is for develop. And in the list here, you'll see that there's the, um, the G++ or GNU compiler, and you can select to install it. So I haven't installed already, but you want to select to install it. So that's the key. That's one of the key ones. The other one is going to be make. Um, again, that allows you to actually compile that or, or run the make command. And so then you'll, again, this down here, it's, you search for make, it's underneath develop, um, and the GNU version of the make utility, you're going to click that and it's going to be, it's going to install that guy. Um, and then lastly, you're going to want to, um, uh, also there's a couple, there's two, there's CMake and there's make. So you want to actually CMake and make. Um, so I'm going to choose CMake as well. Oops. And then once that's done, um, you hit enter and it'll install it. So this is actually going to install these things. Oh, 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 actually, let me ask Brian. Uh, Brian, you've been taking C. I know that you're uh, you're taking a course right now. What compiler do they have you using? Uh, we're using Visual Studio. Oh, okay, so all right, so we're doing it the down and dirty way. You're doing it the hoity-toity way. Yeah, we've been using Visual <laughs> Studio, but then also on the side, I've been playing with Xcode just so I'm familiar with Mac and Windows stuff. Oh, you cross-platform people. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to do. Okay, I'm sorry. No, Lou, that, I digress. No, right. Get back to no it. Problem. Yep, no problem. So th this is, you want to use, I, uh, you could use anyone. I mean, Visual Studio is a great place to start if you want to do really fast setup. You go and install the desktop version of uh, Visual Studio Express. You can immediately start writing C, C++ code. Uh, and, you know, compiles, easy, easy, easy done. But then the, the problem with that, though, is, you know, sometimes people say, oh, well, Visual Studio is not going to really, you know, get you using the, the new compilers for, like, C, because those compilers sometimes change very often. So you want to you want to basically um, you want to basically install something. You can install something that's open source, so that's more useful from the internet that will allow you to kind of do more cross-platform development. That's where I, I like to use Sigwin for that. But again, Visual Studio is a good option too. Okay. Now we've got a compiler installed, and there are people in the chat room who are saying, "Oh, just use Notepad." And yeah, actually, I, there's a lot of us who do. Uh, what what do you like writing in? I think. For me, my favorite one here is I'm showing on my screen right now is I, I right now I just like to use Sublime Text. And what you can do is you can integrate the um, compiler directly in what they call the build functionality of it. And you can integrate it directly into the text editor. But it gives you some good um, uh, text highlighting, syntax highlighting. It also gives you a little bit of, of code completion too. So like if I start to type, it gives you, um, you know, a, gives me kind of hints of what I need to type down or what I need to actually put in there. It can give me function names and stuff like that. 
but there's lots of them. I mean, there's no plus plus there's Vim, there's Emacs, there's like you said, just notepad. If you just want to use your text pad, there's really anything you want to develop in, you can develop in. Uh, and then you just run a command line to actually, to actually compile it. So this is an example of the command line using the C99 ISO spec. Um, and I can just run this and now my code uh, is actually compiled. And so if I go to the directory that I have um, here for it, um, I can actually open up, whoops, I can actually open up the um, the file and I can see the executable that's been created here. So if I explore this directory, um, maybe if I spelled it right. Uh, so in the directory, I'll see my main executable here. And if I run it, you'll notice that it's got my code running in there. Hello world. And then it's got some math function I wanted to demonstrate as well. So, I mean, it, it, you can do it on TextPad, you can do it on Notepad, and then you can just use the command line to execute it, or you can go directly in Sublime Text, and I can just use this fancy schmancy control B, and then down below here, it will compile it and run it for me right away. Fantastic. All right, so we've got that. Uh, we, of course, you get to choose your, your own editor of choice, but uh, let's give them the first program, because they need, they need to be able to create something and then compile it. Uh, show me from the start what they need, every single line. You bet. So what's not a program um, without the Hello World program, right? So I think the first thing we should talk about really fast is what these guys think at the top here, what this thing is include. So basically what this is, is they call it a preprocessor, but what it really is doing is it's finding this, this header file that has a bunch of uh, definitions in it, and it's finding that, and it's just pulling it in and copying it into your code. And this standard, um, this, this is called the standard I.O., um, a library and what it's allowing you to do is pull in all of the definitions that they have in there especially to do standard in, uh, input and output for anything for instance consoles and so like it has a it has what they call the printf function and so I can put in here you know hello world and I can immediately get a hello world program out just by doing that right so now if I, run, I actually execute it boom I got hello world at the bottom there finished in 0.3 seconds so there's a lot of other functions, obviously, and there's a lot of other, you know, properties and attributes and everything in this header file. But, you know, what's useful for us right now is just this print definition. So one line of code, boom. One thing that's to also notate is a lot of times when you see a console app or any type of application, especially in C, the operating system is going to look for this main function. And there's two, there's several schemas or um, syntax for the main function. But in this case, the, the general approach is just to use an integer return. This is an integer type or a number. And usually that they do that for like an error, if you want to return an error code to the operating system or something. And then you call it main. And of course, the parentheses just say, hey, I'm not passing anything in there right now, but I could later so I can put parameters here. But for right now, I'm not passing anything in. And then I have a little curly brace for the beginning and the end of that function. And then the operating system immediately when I run this application will call main and then whatever um, uh, um, functionality that's in there in those brackets will run sequentially. And of course, we, we already know this from, from working with C Sharp and some of the other languages, which is that main section. So, and it's called different things in different languages, but that really should be as small as possible. I mean, we're, we don't care right now because this is a beginner module, but eventually you're going to want all the heavy lifting done in functions that get called by main, not done in main itself. Correct. Right. Exactly. So an example that I gave here is I wanted to, there, there, in like C Sharp and some other programming languages, it's really easy to stop the console from like executing and, and coming, you know, it actually returning so you can't see what actually happened. So I wrote a quick function called press enter to, con to con continue. And what that does is it actually does a do while loop until you actually hit enter. And so I called that from in here. So now if I actually run this program, um, it will allow me to I'll actually run it from uh, the directory so we can see how it works. And you'll see that at, right now it'll say, hello world, press enter to continue, right? So I've called a function that's now sitting here waiting for input from me. And so I'm just going to hit enter and boom, now that, that exits the program. So yeah, like you said, you need to break the program up into functions, into, into functional routines. This way it's not as confusing as not everything inside this main function here. Right. And it just makes it cleaner because if you if you keep just function calls inside of, of main, then it means you know what is the process of your program. If you start right. writing subfunctions within main, it gets really, really messy. And and remember, one of the things that we want is we want the ability for another programmer, maybe a member of your team, to be able to pick up your code, see from your comments what's going on, and continue with the project. You can't really right. do that if you make your code a tarball. That's right. And C code is, is basically just um, it's it's really all it does is it evaluates a bunch of expressions. 
And so for you, a function is an expression and it'll, it basically builds up what they call expression trees under the covers and it'll break down what it needs to do. And it will just sequentially go through those and um, uh, execute those expressions that you're expressing to the computer. So that's really all that a function is. In this case, I'm expressing saying, hey, go and call this. And when, as, as you're calling it, wait for the user to do something. Uh, and then when they do it, then return back. So that's really the expression that I'm trying to tell the PC to do. And that's what it's doing for me. Right, right. Oh, if, if we wanted to add a layer of complexity on that, let, let's say we want to send the folks home with uh, Hello World Plus, uh, what would you suggest they do? So I think one of the biggest things is to understand is is to break up the idea of you know variables is to really understand what variables do in your application. We talked about this in some of the other modules, but it's it's fairly the same thing in C. You want to be declare a variable, which is basically just a placeholder in memory for a value. You know you have things like integers and characters or cheat char, which they call it in in, in C. Um, or doubles, which is also a, a double precision a decimal, uh, double precision number um, with decimal place. So, I mean, there's different ways. Learn how to declare variables, learn how to store variables, learn how to store data in those variables, and then, you know, print it out to the screen. That's really how, you know, the beginning programming is, is just, just print stuff out, right? I mean, in this case, I have a math function that I'm doing where I'm I'm showing the um, normal distribution between a number here, right? So, that basically, I'm I'm pulling in the another uh uh, what would call preprocessor director at the top called math and it has about a bunch of math functionality in there and I can use that to do things like evaluate an expression or do the square root of something right so this is allows me and then another thing you can see here is I'm using a different variance of the print function um, this print function allows me to use this uh, formatter right so this we did this in C sharp where you put a little character in there like um, curly bracket zero is in the C sharp case but this is what they call um, just a formatter expression. You're putting percent G, and you're saying, "Hey, I want to put a uh, a number or, or double in that location, and then look the actual number that I want to put is this this thing over here, right?" So it makes it really easy to kind of print stuff to the screen. So try that out. Create some variables. You know, use the print function. Print it out to the screen. See how it works. Learn to compile things. Learn to get the compiler errors. Like for instance, if I were to take this curly bracket out at the top, it's going to say, "Hey, wait a second. You know, you have you don't have a terminating character. You haven't you haven't finished this 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 character string out for me yet. So yeah. I need to go back and put it. Actually, out. we should probably talk a little bit about syntax there because yeah, uh, the missing curly bracket is probably the bane of every C programmer because at some point you're going to miss one and it's it won't give you the error where you think the error should be for that missing curly bracket. So you just have to start to recognize that. We've also got right. Dallas in the chat room who is saying, okay, there's a few things. Again, remember C is very strongly typed. You need to use the right variable for the type of data that you're pulling in. Otherwise, you will get it won't work, or you'll get really, really wrong output. And right. everything is case sensitive, so uh, just just know that. Uh, now let's let's talk about syntax. Let's just talk about main for a second here. Uh, so of course we've got uh, we've got the declaration of main. Uh, why do you have int in front of main? So again, in, in, uh, main is the op is the function that operating systems will look for, and in this case, the normal what they call schema for that function is that it will return an error code of some type. So in this case, most of the time, people return zero if things are successful. So I'll put return in my function return zero, meaning everything was great, worked great, no problems. Um, so the operating system says fantastic, this application runs successfully. Or you can return some kind of error code like negative one or some other number. And then that user says, okay, well, it looks like I got an error code. And then the, maybe the application defines in their help file saying, oh, well, error code number, you know, 400 means I didn't connect correctly, right? So that, so the idea here is it's supposed to return some kind of a code so you understand if the application ran successfully or not. Right. And then the next, the next line down, actually, first we've got the curly brackets. And I, I don't know about you, but when I was programming C, whenever I would put in one curly bracket, I would put in its opposite just to make sure that they would both be in there. Uh, does that still is that a still a convention or am yep. I just old? No, that's that's exactly right. And a lot of a lot of these text notepad editors, not these editors today that allow you to write C code in them or C plus plus code in them, they will automatically put them in for you. So, like for instance, Sublime Text will, uh, Vim will now. Some some of these some of these text editors will actually put it in there so you don't forget. <laughs> right. Uh, next line down, uh, you actually put in a comment, which is good because there's two different ways to comment in C in uh, C, and you've used one of them, which right. comments out a particular line. But can you show? There we go. That's the other way. That comments out an entire section, so it will comment out right. everything between the slash and the uh, and the uh, what do they call that asterisk? Right. So there's a multi what they call multi line or multi. 
uh, breakdown of a comment. Some people like to put like asterisks in the front so you know that this whole thing is like a comment. So you can put asterisks all over the place so that, oh, yeah, yeah. And they're like I said, a single line comment um, uh, makes it useful. So this is, again, all modern languages have these commenting systems, especially multi-line. Right. Uh, and next line down, again, remember, we're, we're really aiming this at the people who, who want to get into on C at the very big, the basic level. Int right. number creates an, a variable, an integer variable called number, right. and you're assigning right. it the value foo. Right. Which so is that's, interesting. That's right. So the reason why I wanted to do that is I wanted to show them what happens when you do something silly like that, right? Because you know that foo is not a number. In this case, it's telling you, wait a second, um, this is probably not right. You're initializing an integer with a pointer. Uh, the pointer means a string variable. So if I put a character, let's not do a string because that's a little bit confusing for this right. point. Let's just do... Like just a, a character. Yeah, there we yeah. go. So now it's going to actually, what it's going to do is it's actually going to compile because what I'm doing is this, if I actually output this number, it's going to say, you know, some garbage character. So if I actually put a number in here now, so now I actually, this is syntactically set number to an actual number, right? So if I do something else, like for instance, put a, actual decimal point in there again this which is this, not an integer that's right so this what this will do is it'll actually um it will actually round this number because now what you've done is you've put a decimal value um or a double uh double or precision pointed decimal in there and it's saying oh well you know integers are whole numbers so they're real they're real numbers you can't actually put this so if i were to actually output this to the screen um you would actually see that um this is going to come out as two Oops. Uh, this thing, argument one cast. Oh, I have to actually put in uh, this little guy here. So this formatter thing. There we go. So if we put, so you see now it's put next to my little hello where I should have put a, a new line thing here so this we can see it better. So you notice it actually uh, rounded it out because it's not actually decimal. Right. And if I change this now to a decimal or double, I think the this is a G. Oops. So we're going to use a different notation rather than uh, called G. And now if we actually look, now we get 2.2. So you have to be very careful sometimes is because the compiler is not going to know what you've meant sometimes. It, the, the compiler says, oh, you put a number in there, but you, you know, in this case, we're not going to, it's not going to actually tell you that the number that you put in there has a decimal and they, the, the static data type that you're using doesn't allow that, right? So there's some rules that you have to go and look up. That's why I say play with the data types, play with variables so you understand some of the rules that they, they go through that the compiler is not going to find. Right. And actually, Brian, uh, your early assignments, it seemed like your professor was always trying to, to mess you up with data types. That, that was like the purpose of some of the early homework assignments I, that you showed to me, which is they wanted you to use the wrong type so that you would get strange, strange output. It, not necessarily an error, but just not what you expected. Yeah, yeah, that was definitely one of the first things that we played with. But, Lou, I have a quick question. Why do yeah. you have the percent I? I know the slash n gives it the, the extra, that ends the line, but what's the percent I in that printf function That's there? a good question. So what this, the percent I does is it allows me to print out the type. So I can just pass in the type over here, and I can print out whatever's inside that variable um, in this case, it's an integer, so the percent %i will then allow me to print that, that variable. So if I wanted to put a whole bunch of stuff in here, the number is percent %i, and then what the compiler would do, what will happen at runtime is that whatever's in the variable here, so in this case, 2, will be replaced inside there. So if I run this, so you notice here I keep forgetting to put my new line in here. This is called a new line formatter. There we go. So now we see the number is two. So I can put a whole long string, a character array or a long string in here of whatever I want. And if I wanted to put some variables in there, like for instance, number, I can replace that with, with the variable number. Okay. So if you were to put a second variable in there, like if you Correct. did in, uh, I don't know, number a double, like a, du a double and then have that in the line too. So then you right. would just put that that character name in there is that correct so like i could put you know number uh, and then i can put another one here also percent i and we take the new line out from here and i put the new number over here so it lets you put pass in as many as you want in this case so if you run this now now you have two okay and it just it will grab whatever the next uh that's right 
whatever the next yep. one is. Okay. So it's a little bit more declarative in C sharp. Like for instance, C sharp, you would put zero, one, like this, and then like you would know that this is the first one and the second one, and that's what will replace these. But within C, it's it's not as declarative. It it just says, okay, well, we'll just put them in order that you put them in there. Okay. So yeah, if you flipped it and you put number two before number, then it would grab the four before the two, I guess. Exactly right. Yep. So I. It's a little confusing, but yeah. it's, you know, you got to get used to it. Yep. <laughs> Makes sense. Okay. Yeah. I yep. was not familiar with the percentage uh, and then declaring the the integer. Right. And then, so like we, another thing to note is there's different formatters. Like for instance, if I wanted to put, again, my decimal in here, my double number, if I wanted to put this in here, I actually have to use a different formatter, which is called this guy here. And then I have to put another number and then compile this, and you'll notice now it replaced it. But if I actually were to put this as I, it would yell at me. Okay, so are you just picking G some, because you like the character G, or is that something specific? No, that's yeah. that's these are just different formatter types. So if you go look up in all the help documentation for printf in the standard input-output library, you'll uh -huh. look that, you'll notice that G is for doubles and I is for integers, and so you have to use the correct formatter. You notice here it put a bunch of junk here, which is probably a memory location <laughs> of some type. So it doesn't really know what I'm trying to do in this case. So in my case, I want to put G in there and then it'll come out correctly. Whoops. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hold on here. Brian, are you having Lou do your homework? <laughs> uh, not quite yet. Do you write this down? Uh, if we were to do classes pretty soon, that's about uh, where we're at in class. Here. So, uh, if so you want to yeah, help me out with that. Maybe the next module? Okay, yeah. got it. Actually, Lou, uh, if we go back to your, to your screen there, uh, yeah. uh, another quick point, uh, the semicolon. Every line ends with a semicolon. This is probably, uh, other than the curly quotes, uh, uh, the uh, curly brackets, this is probably the second most made mistake in C. Right. Yeah, make sure you always end, and a lot of things a lot of people don't know is you don't necessarily need to un end your, end, re you know, finish your functions with a semicolon, but definitely finish any type of variable definition or when you assign something to a variable, that kind of thing, you want to enter, you want to finish it off. Um, a lot of times when you're doing like do while loops, you're doing loops, which right. we'll get into later on, you want to end, end them with semicolons. This way, it's kind of a terminator for that expression, they like to call it. Right. And as long as we're in the printf line, uh, one of the things that uh, the people get confused with is, uh, I, I see this a lot in beginning programmers, when they try to put special characters into the, the string of characters that they're trying to print, and it doesn't work. Like, for example, if you try to print quotation marks just by putting a quotation mark in there, it's going to kill it. You actually have to use a special character in order to make that print properly. Right, and exactly right. So it might you might get confused what you're trying to do. Like if I if I keep putting like single quotation marks, it will actually output. <laughs> it's working. No, I, I think printf actually is uh, what they call literal. So that means anything you put in there is literal unless you use these special um, formatters. So, like, friends, if I wanted to do a new line or a tab, I could put these special formatters in there, and you notice, like, it puts a tab in there. But anything else I put in here is going to be the exact characters that I put in there. Right. Uh, let's go down to the function call. So you created a function here called press enter to continue, and that's how you call it. So oh, it's press enter to continue. It's not passing any parameters, but you could. You've got, you've got the little brackets there so that you right. can do it. At that point in the main, it, the compiler is going to get to that. It's going to leave main, go up to that function, and run the function. Now, we get a question here every once in a while, Alex, I used to, is, you know, people were wondering, well, can I put the functions below main? Can I have main at the top? And that that doesn't always work out well, right, Lou? Correct. We'll actually do that so we can see what happens. So what happens is the programmer, the program is, the compiler is going to say, wait a second, I have no idea uh, what this is. So it's going to say here, some previous decoration, it's going to try to run it, right? And it's going to try to actually, uh, it's going to give you a warning. It's going to say, no, you should probably move this. There's conflicting stuff here. Let me move this. Let's run it again. Yeah, just remember that the compiler is looking from top to bottom, left to right. That's right. That's right. So in this case, it's actually being smarter than we thought because it's, it's, going, to, it's going to say, okay, well, I found the definition for it. So the compiler says, oh, well, let me go and run that. But it's warning me, saying that there's something wrong here, right? It's it's conflicting. It's something wrong. So I need to probably, if I move it out of the way, move it back up here. Now if I run it, I'm getting yeah. more warnings, right? Yeah. And well, and that, that compiler was being smart. So you've got a more yeah. advanced compiler that said, okay, let me look through the entire program before I, I stop. But the convention is to declare it before you actually use it. Right. And I was using the C89 compiler yesterday for all my examples, and it will literally... 
yell at you saying, I, this is not defined yet. We need to find that definition right. for it. Now, let's go up to the function. So you declared this function at the top. You, you press enter to continue. And inside right. of it, you've got a couple of interesting features. So, of course, we've got our curly brackets. Make sure those are in there. In right. C, so you're declaring an integer, a variable uh, called C, that's going to hold yes. an integer value. You've got a printf, which is just a standard print out the screen. F flush. We haven't seen that before. <laughs> so this is this is a, a again an SDI a standard input output variable. It's basically just flushing that whatever the contents in the standard output today right now. So saying anything that you've entered before and hit it enter if you've hit the escape key anything like that just flush it out. Just don't don't, don't use it right now because we're gonna we want to basically get the next character that the user is gonna enter. So this is again look up the definition for this so you can kind of understand a little bit better. But it's just making it getting getting the console ready for me to to capture something from the user. Right, and that's also just because whenever we declare a variable, if you don't assign it a uh, a, a value, it could actually be anything. And C, you remember when you when you declare space, you you set aside space. That space could actually be filled up with random junk, and you need to you need to do something to make sure that that junk's not interfering with your input or output. Right. All right. So let's go to that uh, to that next line. You've got a do now. Uh, this is interesting. We haven't had do before. <laughs> so. This is what they call what they call a do while loop, and what it's saying is it's it's saying do this, do get the latest character, while I determine if it's actually um, one of these things, if it's a new line or if it's end of function at all. So what is or EOF, and it's basically gonna keep, every time you put in a character. So if I were to run this and uh, from the actual command line here, so if I actually run this guy, if I keep entering characters in here. You notice it's not going to do anything until it actually hits that character like a new line or an enter. So if I enter finally, it determines, oh, wait, it's uh, exactly the characters that I have in here. And so these are these are called conditional statements. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit later. But basically, it's saying these are these are like different ways to say if it's not equal to uh, a new line and as well as it's not equal to the end of function uh, end of file. Right, right. And you, you could also do this with a loop and if-then statements, but this is more elegant. Right. And it, like, there's another way of doing it where they call a while loop. There's another one called a for loop. For loop is just a condensed version of this while, of this do while loop. So I like to use you know, the higher level uh, ways of doing these up front so you can kind of understand the convention underneath the covers. Now, you've got some conditional operators here. This is important because anytime right. we want to do any decision-making statements, these will save you a lot of time or they just make make it possible for you to, to have a solution. Explain to, me oh, explain to me exactly what conditional operators you've got there and what they're doing. Sure. So like, for instance, there's conditional operators, meaning if I were to put two equals here, it's saying that while if the C code, um, if this C, the variable character that we're getting actually equals a new line, then, then, um, then do something, right? But in this case, I want to say it's not equal to, meaning it's not actually going to ever be that. In this case, it will wait until it's actually that character. And then we have another one over here called double and. And this is saying, don't just wait for the new line, but also wait for the potential as well as and or as well as the end of the file. So it's saying that in order for this to be true, it's either this and this. And there's other operators called ors. If I wanted to put an or operator in here, where it can see, is it the new line or it could be the end of file? So there's lots of different ways to actually do this. This is what they call Boolean logic, um, or to basically determine what the what you're actually want to determine for that for that function call. So in this case, we're using not equals to. But again, you can use not equals to. You can be use greater than or equals to. You can use you know greater than or less than that kind of thing. There's lots of different expressions here that you can put in here. And you, again, I would. Try them out to see how they work and 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 determine what they use what their uses. Oh, so uh, I booker in the chat room is, is saying so either argument satisfy the do while when you pair them up with an and and no, uh, actually it's the other way around. So if we were put if we were to put an or there, it means that either or would satisfy that that statement. In this case, only both of them. Right. Exactly right. So both of them so. have to be true. Both. Uh, um, Okay, wait, hold on. Wait, now see, you're messing me up. Both of them have to be true and in order for the while loop to stop. Correct. There. <laughs> oh, I hated this part. <laughs> <laughs> Boolean logic, stop it. 
Uh, okay, okay. So that that's a pretty good rundown. And and again, you're going to have all that code. Those will, those assets will be available to you. So you don't have to copy it off of the screen. You will have proper code that you can use inside your compiler. But as Lou said, especially when you're getting started, no matter what compiler you choose, start making errors because you want to be able to interpret those error messages. One of the worst things that, that happens in C is when your program gets really long and you have an error and you have no idea how to interpret it. You can't tell if it's, is it a missing semicolon? Is it a missing bracket? Did I use the wrong type? Uh, and also, I, I think actually maybe even the, 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 the errors that bug me more than those errant semicolons are when I have output that just, it's not right, but it doesn't give me an error. I mean, technically the program will run, it's just not running the way I want it to. Uh, Lou, what else do they need to go, to need to know before they, they move on to homework tonight? I think I think that, that this is probably enough. I think because we, we can get into <laughs> the very lot. complex stuff. Yeah, you know, we can get into complex stuff like pointers and you know pointer arithmetic and arrays and all that stuff. But again, this is this is a good start. Make sure you you try this out. Get your variables in there. You know, use the standard input output. Get some, you know print stuff to the screen. Maybe even capture stuff to the screen. Try to actually capture stuff. In my case, I gave you an example where I'm capturing the next character of the screen. For this case, looking for an enter right. So again, do some stuff like that. Try it out. Uh, maybe capture some care, some some text from the screen and do something with it, right? Maybe print out, you know, hello world with plus somebody's name or something like that. Right. Or you know, build your own calculator. Maybe that's another option. Is we showed you, a, gave you an option to do a function, and you can pass in some numbers. Maybe try to build a function similar to this. Press enter, but again, make it so you can pass some numbers to it. So I guess just build that out. Try those things out, and then we'll move on to some more complex stuff later. Yeah, Brian, you think maybe maybe that uh, we could make a calculator with multiple functions that handled each type of uh, of a mathematical operation? You think maybe mm. you could do that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think. Could we have it ready before next Thursday? Because I, I I might have a due date for that actually. <laughs> I I actually I made an agreement with Brian. I said, hey, you know, if you want to start making your homework the actual homework assignments, we could <laughs> we could do that. We could work out some sort of deal here. I don't, I don't know if Lee will, will be up for it. <laughs> Lou Maresca, our code warrior and also our super special guest co-host. We're going to have to work on that. Uh, thank you so very much for being with us. And thank you for breaking down this knowledge. I mean, C, yeah, if, if, I were, if I were to have it all to do again, I probably would have made C the very first module we ever did. Because it is so fundamental. It is so basic. And right. it's really easy for people to get into. Uh, we're going to make sure that they have the resources that you pointed out, all the websites, so they can download the different programs that you... You made available but can you please tell the folks where they can find you and your work definitely i'm at lou mm on twitter uh l-o-u-m-m -M. and of course all my work during my daily job is at crm.dynamics.com lou Maresca, our code warrior once again sir we salute you now folks that's it for this episode of coding 101 but don't worry because we've got plenty more coming we do the show live every monday at 2 30 p.m pacific time just go to live.twit.tv. If you drop in early, you can see the pre-show, and then you can stay late and watch the post-show and pretty much everything that goes in between. You can see all the, the little bumbles and foibles that we have to take out of the finished product. Also, don't forget, if you're going to watch live, you might as well jump into the chat room. You'll see me every once in a while looking up up here, right, right about there. That's you. If you're in the chat room, I can see what you're typing. If you've got questions, I can ask our Code Warrior or our co-host. If you've got comments, if you've got something that you just think we need to know, it's a really good way to be part of the Twit TV experience. Also, don't forget that you can follow me on Twitter. Just go to twitter.com slash Padre SJ. That's at Padre SJ. If you follow me there, you'll find out what we're going to be doing on every episode of Coding 101. You'll see what we got for future modules. You'll see who we have for guests and co-hosts. And you'll also find out when I'm getting steam buns for Brian because uh, he loves him some steam buns, which it's probably not good for him. Uh, <laughs> I, I think that thing has like 5,000 grams of sugar, but that's whatever. That's you didn't okay. tell me that. Sorry about that. You may need... <laughs> I was blissfully unaware. You may need some insulin. They're so good, though. Oh, they're really good. Uh, don't forget that you can find all of our uh, episodes at twit.tv slash code or coding 101. It all goes to the same place. Not only will you find our back episodes along with links to GitHubs and to code for uh, the assets, but you'll also find a place where you can download every episode automatically to your device of choice. If you want the audio version in your iPhone, maybe the video version in your iPad, perhaps you want the high-definition version in your laptop, your desktop, your Mac, your PC, we've got it all for you because we love you. 
Finally, I want to thank everyone who makes this show possible, to Lisa and Leo for letting me take up this space. Of course, to my fantastic TD, Mr. Brian Cranky Hippo Burnett. Brian, can you tell the folks where they can find you on the Twit TV network? Uh, well, they can find me on Thursday doing Know How With You. We always have some new project we're working on, uh, so check that out. And then Fridays, we do BYB. Uh, occasionally, I do reviews, depending on uh, how much time I have in the week. And uh, we've got some other cool stuff coming up, but I don't think I can talk about it. No, that we yet. can't. Actually, there's, it is embargoed. But, mm. Mm. but that'll be cool. So stick around, watch, check out that stuff. And yeah, you can find me on Twitter at Cranky underscore Hippo. Until next time, I'm Father Robert Ballester, the Digital Jesuit. This has been Coding 101. End of line.